We will start our next video, continuing on in our study of genetics, with a little bit of a review from meiosis um, and how this relates to chromosomes, genes, and inheritance. So recall that humans have 23 pair of chromosomes, and each of these chromosomes is essentially just made up of tightly wound DNA. And as, as we see in this pair of chromosomes on the figure to the right, this is a homologous pair of chromosomes, meaning that these are the same chromosomes. They have the same genes at the same location. The gene forms might be different, but they contain the same genes. So let's say, for example, that this is a pair of chromosome one. And so the chromosome on the left may be the maternal copy, the one that was inherited from the mother, and the chromosome on the right is the paternal copy, and together we would call this a homologous pair. And we see that I, I've identified some portions on the chromosomes with letters, and these just would represent the locations of certain genes. So for example, this could be gene A, and we see that the maternal copy has the dominant form of gene A, and the paternal copy has the recessive form of gene A. Whereas gene B, both uh, maternal and paternal chromosomes have the dominant form of that particular gene. Allele is the term that we use to describe the form of a gene. So you can have a dominant or a recessive allele for either of these particular traits. The Punnett square was actually not invented by Mendel. It was actually invented by someone named Reginald Punnett, That's why it's named that way. And, and the idea of a Punnett square is that it can give us, first of all, all possible offspring from a particular cross, and it also gives us the probabilities of ratios of these particular offspring. So, Today, we may think of this if there's a, a family that's looking to have children and they have a particular genetic disorder that causes some kind of disease or um, sickness in their family history, they may go in and have genetic testing done and go to a genetic counselor. And essentially, they're using this same idea behind the Punnett square to say, is it possible that you can have a child that would have the genotype? And if so, what's the likelihood of that occurring? Let's just talk about a few terms. First of all, the, the term genotype, excuse me, I didn't mean to mark it out. The term genotype just refers to an actual, the genetic makeup of an organism. So this would be the DNA sequence that is on those chromosomes that, that produces this particular protein, okay? So we're identifying these genes with certain characteristics and we're, we're calling these genes with, we're naming these genes with letters. So if we look at our example to the right, we have two possible seed types, and this, this is back to Mendel's pea plants. So the seeds or the peas could, act, could be yellow, or they could be green. There's two possible outcomes, and the yellow one is actually dominant to the green seed color. Therefore, we are going to use the letters capital Y to represent the yellow allele and little y to represent the green allele. So the genotype of this green P or green seeded P would have to be little y, little y, because that's the only way it can be green. If there's one big Y, that would mask the green trait or characteristic, and it would be yellow. The phenotype is the actual physical appearance, something that you can observe. So is it green or is it yellow? That's the phenotype. The term homozygous, homo meaning two of the same, in this case we're talking about the same alleles. There's two ways an organism can be homozygous, either homozygous dominant, meaning both of the alleles are the dominant form. In our example of seed color, this would be big Y, big Y. And in homozygous recessive, both copies of the alleles are the recessive form, little y, whoops, little y. The other alternative is heterozygous, meaning two different alleles, capital Y, little y, would be the only way to be heterozygous in this particular example. Mendel also proposed some laws that he felt explained what was going on genetically. The first one is called the law of independent assortment. 
And, and basically what this says, I have it listed here for you in short, chromosome 1 does not influence chromosome 2 or chromosome 3, so on and so forth. And you'll recall in meiosis, in metaphase 1, which is the cell's way of producing the gametes, the chromosomes line up in their pairs. And so what this is saying is the way the chromosomes line up, the way chromosome 1 pairs line up, has no influence on chromosome 2 pairs or 3 pairs or so on and so forth. One way that you can think of this in something that, that you're familiar with is if you had, like we have 23 pair of chromosomes, if you took 23 quarters and you laid them out in a row, and then you flip the first quarter, let's say it was heads. That has no influence on what happens to the next quarter that you flip. If you flip the, flip the second quarter, it might be heads, it might be tails. It has just the same likelihood to be either one. It doesn't matter what the first quarter was. They're independent events is what you would call it in statistics. And that's exactly what Mendel was proposing with the law of independent assortment. The next um, idea that Mendel was the one who first coined was the law of segregation. And this is actually talking about a specific set of chromosomes. So if you're talking about chromosome one, okay, it means that it's just as equally likely for the paternal copy or the maternal copy to make it into a gamete. They have equal likelihood of becoming a, that particular allele being in the sperm or in the egg. So Punnett squares are very useful in determining or predicting what are possible offspring and what are the ratios that we expect to see. It's important when you set up the Punnett square the whole idea is to say, here are all the possible gametes. Remember that gametes are the sperm and the egg that are produced from meiosis. Gametes have genotypes, just like organisms have genotypes. But the whole idea of meiosis in making the gametes, or the sperm and egg, is to cut the genetic material in half. That way, when the sperm and egg fuse, you've restored the normal number of chromosomes. So as we look at the gametes, we need to make sure we understand that we're looking at half of the genetic material in our gametes. So the gametes for parents are listed across the top of the Punnett square and then down the side. We'll, we'll look at that in just a second on the next slide. In the Punnett square, the internal boxes represent possible offspring or zygotes, new organisms from this particular cross. The figure on the left shows us an example of what's called a monohybrid cross. Mono meaning one trait, and hybrid that you're crossing two different parents that are true breeding for traits, for, for different traits. So we have one parent true breeding for yellow seeds and one parent true breeding for green seeds. Those are the parent generation, the P generation. So the F1 then is going to be a heterozygous individual. Now what I want you to see is let's first look at the parent generation at this parent that, that produces yellow seeds. The genotype of the parent is big Y, big Y. It only has the dominant allele, that's it. So when you, when you half the genetic material, when those big Y, big Y separate in meiosis, there's only one possibility, right? Whether this is the male or the female parent, the gamete can only receive a, a capital Y, that's all there is. If we look at this parent, it's the opposite. The only possible allele or genotype for the gamete would be the little y. So the only gamete possible for this one is little y, the only gamete possible for this is big y. When you combine those two, that's your only possible offspring, big y, little y. Now, if we take the F1 individual and we allow it to self-pollinate, so it's serving as both parents, we're going we're gonna to set up a Punnett square to say, what would the offspring possibilities be for a cross, a self-pollination with the F1? Now, the genotype of this is big Y, little y, so there are both alleles present. So that means that whether it's sperm or egg, the possibility the gamete can receive either the big Y or the gamete can receive the little Y. So we have to represent that as part of our Punnett square. 
So this here represents the Punnett square for this F1 cross. And the, this area across the top represents one parent, and this area down the side represents the other parent. Okay? And these areas are for the gametes. So whether it's sperm or egg, the, these are the parent's possible gametes. So since our F1, let me clear some of this off so we can see what we're doing. Since the F1 has both possible alleles, then we know that one of the gametes can be big Y from this parent, and one of the gametes can be little y. We get those from the genotype. We take half to make a gamete because of meiosis. Down the side, we have the same thing. One of the gametes can be big Y and one can be little y. At this point, you just fill in the boxes based on the gametes. So you carry each of the gametes down or across, depending on their position. Let's erase some of this away. So for example, for this parent, the big Y in this gamete fills this box, and it fills this box. The little Y fills this box, and it fills this box. The parent here, the big Y fills here and here, and the little Y fills here and here. What you can see at the end of that cross is that we report this in ratios, both genotypic and phenotypic ratios. So if we look at the genotypic ratios first, we see we have one offspring that can be big Y, big Y, or homozygous dominant. We have two offspring that are the heterozygote, big Y, little y. So here's the one dominant, two heterozygotes. And we have one offspring that is the homozygous recessive, little y, little y. So the genotypic ratio would be 1 to 2 to 1, reporting the homozygous dominant first, then the heterozygous, then the homozygous recessive. Now if we report the phenotypic ratio, we're not interested in big y's or little y's, we're interested in what's the physical appearance. So we're interested which ones have yellow seeds, which one has green seeds. So three of these out of the four are the yellow seeded, and only one is the green seeded. And this three to one ratio explains what Mendel's observation was about the purple versus white flowers, that he always got about three to, three to one purple to white flowers. A test cross is a method to help identify an organism that has the dominant phenotype when you don't know the genotype of the organism. So if you find a green pea, you know the genotype has to be homozygous recessive or little y, little y, because that's the recessive phenotype. There's only one way to be green. But if you find a yellow pea and you have no idea, or a plant that produces yellow peas, you don't know the genotype, then you can't, excuse me, you can't tell by looking at the yellow seed because it could be homozygous dominant, big Y, big Y, or it could be heterozygous. As long as it has one dominant allele, it will be yellow. So a test cross is a way to determine what the genotype really is for an organism that has the dominant phenotype. You cross the unknown organism with an organism that is homozygous recessive, that has the recessive phenotype. If all of the offspring have the dominant phenotype, then you know that this unknown allele had to be the big Y. That's the only way that all four or 100% of the offspring would be yellow. If the cross yields green seeded offspring, then you know this missing allele that you weren't sure about had to be little Y because that's the only way that you could actually have green seeded or the recessive phenotype present is if this one originally was the heterozygote. We're going to finish up the lectures, our last um, topic, 
and it's called a dihybrid cross. So it's similar to the monohybrid cross that we looked at earlier, but di means two. So we're talking now, instead of just one trait, we're talking about two separate traits that we're combining into one Punnett square. Again, in the P generation, we have true breeding parents that are um, different, but in this case, it's for two different characteristics or traits, not just one. So the traits we're looking at is this parent is yellow and round, and both of those are the dominant phenotype. Homozygous is dominant for both, and this one is green and wrinkled, and those are both the recessive phenotype. So we know that the F1 is essentially going to be the heterozygote, right? It's going to get one of the dominant alleles, one of the recessive alleles, one of these dominant alleles, one of these recessive alleles, and we end up with a hybrid or a heterozygote. Where it's interesting, just like with the monohybrid cross, is in the F2 generation. So if we allow the F1 to self-pollinate, then the F1 serves as both parents. And so we have, again, the gametes across the top for one parent and the gametes down the side for the other parent. In this case, the gametes are exactly the same for both parents because we have one parent that's, one plant that's serving as both parents. Now, the, the tricky part for the dihybrid cross really is just making sure that you know how to determine all possible combinations of gametes for both of these traits. And so the FOIL method is actually one good way to make sure that you're um, covering all possible gametes. And FOIL just stands for first, outer, inner, and last when you're talking about your genotypes. So let's look at foiling this particular genotype to see what we would get. And remember, the gametes have half of the genetic material or half of the chromosomes versus the parent. So in this case, since we have two traits versus one from the monohybrid cross, we're going to have two letters in the, in the gamete genotype. So it's half of whatever the organism is, that's what you find in the gamete. Now let's FOIL. So we're going to take the first letter for each trait, big Y, big R, that's this gamete, okay? And then we're going to do the outer letters, so that's big Y, little r, and that one's here. Then we're going to do the inner letters, and that would be little y, big R, right here. And lastly, we'll do the last two letters for both traits or characteristics, little y, little r. That is all possible combinations that those genotypes can have to form gametes from that parent. So once you have the, the gamete genotype filled in at the top, it's the same down the side, then you just do this, you carry these letters down the row, carry these letters down the column, do that for all of those. Fill in your Punnett square, and you see that there are many, many combinations for the offspring. In a one trait cross, like we did earlier, the, the Punnett square only had four interior boxes. In a two trait cross, we have 16 interior boxes in our Punnett square. But what you find at the end is there's a specific phenotypic ratio that you will always see in a dihybrid cross. And that is there will be nine organisms or, or offspring, possible offspring, that will have the dominant phenotype from both traits, so round and yellow. And then you'll have three organisms that have the dominant phenotype of one and the recessive of the other, in this case round and and green. Then you have three others that have the opposite. So in this case we have the dominant phenotype is yellow but the recessive phenotype is wrinkled. You have one individual that is recessive for both traits, so green and wrinkled. 
So this nine to three to three to one ratio is always found in a dihybrid cross. But remember, dihybrid meaning you started from the P generation with true breeding parents and you ended up with a hybrid, which then self-fertilized. So you have essentially both heterozygous parents. That's what yields the nine to three to three to one. So at this point, it's very important that you look at the problem set, work them for yourselves, and then check your answers with the video answers. And as always, let me know if you have any questions.